In 1948, American psychologist B.F. Skinner reported some unusual animal behaviour. He placed a succession of hungry pigeons inside a cage, where an automated machine delivered food to them at certain intervals, and observed that the birds started repeating actions that had coincided with the delivery of the food. They behaved as if their actions were influencing the food to appear, as if there was some kind of causal connection, when in fact there was none. The food would have appeared at the same intervals whatever the birds did. At about the same time Skinner published his paper, Superstition in the Pigeon, psychologist Bertram Forer was conducting a study relating to a human superstition, astrology. He gave each of his subjects a test, followed by a confidential personality analysis, which he told them was based on their test results. When they were asked to rate their analysis for accuracy on a scale of 0 to 5, 5 being the most accurate, the average rating came out at 4.26. Forer later revealed that all subjects had received exactly the same analysis, taken from horoscopes in an astrology book. The Fora effect, named after him, refers to people's tendency to be impressed by personality readings given by astrologers and other pseudoscientists, which they're led to believe are tailored to them individually, but are actually general enough to apply to most people. Fora's experiment, which has since been replicated many times with the same basic results, is an important demonstration that the seemingly impressive accuracy of horoscopes can easily be reproduced without birthdays or planetary positions playing any role. According to superstition, a wedding ring dangled over the belly of a pregnant woman can predict the baby's gender. A circular motion predicts a girl, a straight pendulum swing predicts a boy. This involves the same mechanism found in dowsing, the superstitious belief that one can detect underground water or other hidden substances with dowsing rods. It actually works by amplifying small, almost imperceptible movements of the hand. This hand movement is often an unconscious idiomotor effect whereby one's expectations lead one to make involuntary movements in line with those expectations. Sometimes dowsing rods are even used on maps, which are declared somehow to have the same detectable energies as the terrain they depict. Wedding ring predictions, dowsing, automatic writing and Ouija board activity have all been attributed to the idiomotor effect, though the person making the involuntary action might be convinced the movement is coming from elsewhere. Of course, often there is a deliberate attempt to deceive others. The belief that we can contact spirits with Ouija boards is one of countless superstitions surrounding death, and countless television shows seek to give evidence of ghosts and spirit channeling. Viewers send in footage in which spots of light are leapt on as so-called ghostly anomalies, and self-proclaimed mediums declare they can channel spirits in shows that disclaimers admit are for entertainment purposes only. Interestingly, when magicians give their audiences apparently uncannily accurate details about their lives and relationships, our typical response is what's their trick? But when others do the same posing as psychic mediums, the response is often they must have supernatural powers. All that differs between the self-proclaimed medium and the self-confessed showman is presentation style. If the showman doesn't need supernatural powers, nor does the medium. In the fifth season of the so-called ghost hunting show Most Haunted, its resident medium Derek Akora behaved as if possessed by the spirit of Creed Kafer, but it was later reported that this name had been invented and misinformation about the fictitious person had been fed to Derek prior to filming to test his integrity. As filming began and Derek became swept up in the persona of the non-existent spirit, he didn't realise that Creed Kafer was an anagram of Derek Faker. He went on to channel a similarly fictitious highwayman, whose name was an anagram of Derek Lies. Many superstitions revolve around the treatment of illness, and many want their superstition to be regarded as authentic medicine. Homeopathy involves preparations that have been repeatedly and extremely diluted, until it's statistically uncertain that there's even one molecule of active ingredient present. How do homeopaths justify selling water as medicine? They claim water has a memory of the substances with which it's had contact. A major problem with this claim, even if there were valid evidence to support it, is that the water that the homeopath sells you may have had contact not only with the substance claimed to treat your health, but with countless other substances during its natural existence. The 1023 campaign has staged mass overdoses of homeopathic products around the world to protest against their sale and raise awareness of the problems with homeopathic claims. Homeopathy hasn't been shown to have any effect beyond placebo, when receiving and having confidence in a dummy treatment can itself lead to an improvement in health. Some feel that if placebos sometimes show improvement, then deceiving people into thinking a fake medicine actually works does no harm or is ethically justified. 
Among the well-known objections to this idea is that if people come to rely on treatments with no scientific validity, they may fail to pursue treatments that would be effective. But a 2010 study by Ted Kapchuk and his colleagues indicates that the placebo effect may work even when you know it's a placebo. They divided IBS patients into two groups. One received no treatment, the other was given dummy pills twice daily and told the pills had no active ingredient. The word placebo was even printed on the pill bottle. And yet the study's results showed that the group who knew they were taking placebos had significantly greater relief from their symptoms than the no treatment group. As Kapchuk points out, there may be benefits simply in the performance of a medical ritual. More research is needed in this area, but anything that might help to rid us of medical deception would seem to be worthwhile. As a child, I was brought up to think there was a divine creator of the universe that listened and responded to prayers. If I prayed and nothing happened, I was told I must have prayed for the wrong thing, or didn't pray hard enough, or that my prayer was answered, but in an indirect way I'd discover later. I eventually worked out that a god that moved so mysteriously I had no idea what it had actually done may as well not be there at all. Anne prays she'll find a parking space in town. She finds one. Was her prayer answered, or was it too trivial a request to make of a god and just a happy coincidence she got her space? If it's coincidence in this case, why not in others? On what basis do people rule out coincidence? Careful analysis or unreliable intuition? Ben's daughter suddenly stops breathing. He prays she'll be okay until the ambulance arrives. She dies. Are we meant to believe Ben's prayer wasn't good enough, or that there was a different divine plan for him and the child? If our fates are already divinely decided, then prayer would have no effect, even if gods existed. Big problems arise when superstitions get so well established that any outcome reinforces them. So if you pray, dance for rain, or put on what you think is a lucky hat, then get the results you want, you go on praying, dancing, or wearing the hat. But if you don't get the desired results, you still pray, dance, or wear the hat, certain that it will work for you again. In this way, you create a bias towards confirming the causal connection you've made, and a blindness to conflicting information that would help you identify your mistake. Once that happens, you've built a barrier to rational thinking, and you've departed from reality. Like Skinner's pigeons, you're left flapping about in a psychological cage of your own making, blocked from realising your actions are not having the effect you imagine. If we find Skinner's pigeons quaint and amusing, if we find ourselves thinking, if only they could understand, how much more should we, with our much greater intelligence, be prepared to examine our own behaviour and confront the false beliefs that are literally getting us nowhere? Superstitions can give some a comforting illusion that they have more control in their life than they actually do. But their effects can be more oppressive, especially when the superstitious insist that others share or support these irrational beliefs. We might know people whose reaction when we put new shoes on a table or open an umbrella indoors is clearly designed to make us stop the unlucky behaviour and thereby validate their magical thinking. This is one way in which superstitions extend their tyrannical grasp beyond the believer, and we do well to resist this kind of manipulation. If some are happy to let evidence-free beliefs rule their lives, so be it, but they've no right to expect the collaboration of others. When you reject superstition, you no longer feel protected by good luck charms, but you also stop worrying about black cats and broken mirrors. Holy water can't bless you, but curses can't harm you. Crystals or homeopathy may not improve your health, but you'll also be less vulnerable to psychological and financial exploitation from medical charlatans. You can't control people with magic rituals but they can't do the same to you. Perhaps most importantly, good and evil supernatural forces no longer get the credit or blame for what human beings do. Instead, it can be clearly understood that people are responsible for their own kindness, cruelty, generosity, meanness, laziness, or hard work. Owning responsibility can give a sense of genuine self-control, but it does mean learning from mistakes. When we follow superstitions, our mistakes become invisible to us, because we've already mixed them into our whole way of thinking. If we tell ourselves magic can solve our problems, or rid us of guilt for any wrong we do, that's a much easier ride than thinking critically or holding ourselves accountable. But if the price is denying reality, becoming fearful of knowledge, being unable to distinguish true and false claims, or demonising difference, it's worth considering the possibility that that easy ride will cheat you out of much more in the long run. With a little careful critical thought, we can identify our own cages of superstition and walk free of them 